evening everyone i am shubham ghat and on behalf of cnmst students wing i extend my warm welcome to each and everyone present here for our day 2 of webinar session nuclear medicine 2020 i would like to firstly thank all the members senior members and the students for joining today as well we are really happy for such a great response from you all yesterday regarding our first day series and we shall give our best today as well and in the upcoming sessions as well uh, yesterday's sessions covered some of the basic yet important topics like history of nuclear medicine basics of nuclear medicine physics and radiation units by our three student presenters today in our day 2 session we'll be having a total of six sessions the first session will be delivered by biprojit nath from iit kharagpur he'll be presenting on the topic radi radio radiation i mean radioactive decay and its applications over to you biprojit so am i audible children <clears throat> yes you are audible okay so hello everyone and thank you so much for joining um Uh, with us this evening so uh, today is a day 2 uh, of the students wing webinar series uh, nuclear medicine 2020 and today the topic of discussion is on uh, radioactive decay and its applications in nuclear medicine so that's the content which i am going to cover in this uh, presentation i will start with um, the basics of atomic and nuclear structure because yesterday we had a great um, a presentation from mr navneet from aims new delhi uh, we uh, in which he presented a great content from for atomic and nuclear structure uh, followed by a band of stability we'll talk about radioactive decay and its modes uh, we'll talk about alpha decay its applications like uh, radionuclide therapy or alpha therapy we'll talk about bnc we'll talk about beta decades and its applications and many more thing in this presentation so um that's uh, now uh, we all know that atoms are the basic components of matter and uh, we know that atoms are um, composed of uh, positively charged uh, nucleus at the center and uh, negatively charged electrons keep on revolving around uh, the nucleus in circular orbits um, and to neutralize the charge on the of the atoms and this electron uh, rotate around the nucleus in different energy shells in increasing order of energy like we designate those as the k shell uh, the l shell the m shell the n shell and so on and so forth but now the next question is how do we uh, characterize an atom so we uh characterize an atom by a specified number of protons uh, z so for example that's an uh, a nucleate x and it is being specified by a defined number of protons neutrons and a mass number a so that is the number of protons which this nucleate has and is the number of neutrons which it has and a is the total mass number which is which in turn is equals to number of protons plus number of neutrons so that's the basic model which we will study uh and that's the band of stability so that's a graph between a uh, number of protons and a uh, number of neutrons and this line over here that's uh, the line in which n by z is equals to 1 that is number of protons and a uh, number of electro a uh, number of uh, neutrons are equal and those uh, nucleates in black over here are those nucleates which are the stable uh, nucleate and it means that it is uh, relatively stable and it does not decay further to a stable state because it itself is so stable but apart from these black one other one are those nucleates which are unstable for example those in orange over here are those nucleates which decay to the ground state by emitting a positron those in blue over here which decays to the ground state by emitting a uh, negatron or beta minus those in yellow are are those nucleates which decay to the ground state by emitting an alpha particle those in uh, green over here are those nucleates which decay to the ground state by emitting a by by fission process and those in uh, this one over here are those nucleates which decay to the ground state by emitting a neutron and now this presentation is focused on how these all process uh, takes place so that's uh, we'll talk about uh, radioactive decay and we know that all uh, radionuclides are unstable and uh, as something is unstable it wants to attain uh, stability 
So how it attains stability? It, it attains stability by decay. And this decay process to attain stability can be of three different types. It can be a decay by emission of particulate uh, radiations like alpha particles or beta particles. And this decay can be again of um, electromagnetic radiations by or by there is decay by X-ray or gamma radiations or by spontaneous fission. And which decay this uh, radionuclide has to go through, it depends on the composition of the nucleus and it decides which decay process it has to go through. And uh, one more thing is that, that this decay from a parent state to a daughter state, it can be a single process or can be a multiple step process to get a state of stability. For, for example, from that's the parent state that the daughter one over here and both of them are stable. So this decay can be single step to get to a state of stability or a multi-step process to get to a state of stability. So it can be a single step or a multi-step, but the main goal is to achieve stability. And uh, this ratio, which you call is the N by Z ratio of a nucleate, it predicts the uh, stability of a nucleate. And uh, whatever radioactive decay we see, all these decay process occurs to uh, achieve a stability of the nucleus. And how it achieves stability? By altering uh, the number of protons or the neutrons. Fine. So whatever decay we see, and we'll be seeing examples further that uh, in decay process, we are just playing with the number of protons and neutrons we are optimizing the number to get to a state of stable configuration of this number so that the nuclear becomes stable so uh, we can broadly classify these uh, radioactive decay into three different types it can be an alpha decay it can be in beta decay or it can be in gamma decay so we'll talk about each decay in details along with their applications which it holds in uh, medical science and also in nuclear medicine so uh, that's an uh, uh, equation which uh, depicts alpha decay. So alpha decay occurs when the strong nuclear force cannot hold a large nucleus together. So that's a large nucleus. So what it does, it's so unstable. So what it does, it immediately ejects off two protons and two neutrons and get to a stable state. So that's the parent nucleate, which has that number of protons and number of neutrons and a number. So what it does, it's so unstable, it it keep on releasing two protons and two neutrons and goes to a daughter state which has two which has two neutrons less and four atomic number less than the parent one and that's daughter nucleate and that's relatively much more stable than the parent one and along with it it emits an helium nucleus and that's what we call as the alpha particle fine and the mass of the parent nucleus is greater than the mass of the daughter and the helium nucleus and the difference of mass between the parent and daughter along with the helium nucleus is what we call is the disintegration energy that is when this decay occurs this amount of energy is being released that it be 2.13 mev so when this decay occurs this amount of energy will be released and that energy is what we call is the disintegration energy and alpha particles themselves are so stable. And uh, it's because of the highest binding energy per nucleon, which alpha particle has, uh, alpha or helium nucleuses, and that's why it's so stable. So uh, now we will dive inside understanding some applications of this alpha decay process. And the first application of this um, alpha decay process is the radionuclide therapy. And we'll try to uh, understand this uh, example using a, uh, a radionuclide, what, what is uh, called as S13211. So uh, S13211 is, uh, is, uh, S13211 is, a, um, is, a, is a most prominent uh, radionuclide for the alpha particle therapy. And if you go and see, that's a very beautiful uh, radionuclide. Why beautiful? Because it has a half-life of 7.2 hours and it provides uh, enough time for uh, distillation and uh, radio labeling and we can radio label the statin with many more things it can we can uh, radio label it with uh, peptide monoclonal antibodies and small molecules and uh, and uh, one and the most uh, promising part of this statin is that it emits two alpha particles uh, through a split decay uh, pathway. So what actually goes over here that this statin, it can decay to bismuth 207 by emitting an alpha particle, which has energy of 
uh, 5.9 MeV. And through electron capture, this S13 can go through polonium to 111 and it can decay to again lead, which is more stable through emitting an alpha particle. And again, this bismuth can go to uh, lead 207 by emitting uh, by th through electron capture. So we can now see through decay of S13 to lead is accompanied by releasing two alpha particles. And these alpha particles are the main machines for these uh, radionuclear therapy or what you call as the alpha particle therapy. So these alpha uh, particles, they have a, um, they have higher uh, LET. LET is what we call as the linear energy transfer. That is energy transfer per unit length of the track is what we call as the linear energy transfer. So these four alpha particles, these D by DL is quite higher. So, um, so what it is, uh, what these alpha particle does, it goes and deposit energy on the tumor cell. And as because they have lesser range, most energy get deposited in the tumor volume. And after the absorption of energy by these tumor cell, it lead to creation of uh, molecular lesions. And these molecular lesions in turn create, uh, like it, uh, it creates double strand breaks, a single strand breaks, base pair damage, and many more lesions. And because of these unrepaired double strand uh, breaks, it lead to cell death. And that's how these alpha particles are, 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 are results in uh, cell killing effectively. And that's the basic principle behind alpha particle therapy. So now the next application of this alpha particle lies in a great um, uh, a therapy which we call is the boron neutron capture therapy. So before we go deeper inside these therapies, so let us have a brief idea that uh, for uh, boron neutron capture therapy, we need a, a nucleate which is uh, boron 10. And uh, one of the most important property of boron 10 is that it is a great, it has a higher cross section for interaction with thermal neutrons. So neutrons can interact with boron 10 very effectively because it has a higher cross section. Uh, uh, it has a higher cross section. And one more thing is that this boron 10 is, is taken uh, mostly by the neoplastic tissues or neoplastic cell. And how, why it takes, uh, why neoplastic cells takes boron 10, we'll talk about it later. But as of now, you should keep in mind that boron 10 is taken more by the neoplastic tissue. And the absorption of neutron, it converts boron to lithium and it emits an alpha particle. And we know that alpha particles has high LT, it deposits energy over short range, and it, uh, and it kills the cell by creating molecular lesions like double strand breaks, single strand breaks, or unrepaired, uh, or higher number of unrepaired double strand uh, breaks, and thus it kills cells. So now we can see over here that these boron 10 are preferentially taken by the neoplastic cells. In this case, we can see that there is only one, but there are many boron tens uh, taken by the neoplastic cell. So there are many num higher number of boron ten in these um, in this uh, in this cancerous cell. And when we when we irradiate this cancerous cell with bor with thermal neutron, this boron ten captures this boron ten captures this neutron and converts to lithium seven and emits an alpha particle. And this alpha particle then goes and attacks the DNA, causes double thread DNA breaks and, multi and multiple molecular lesions and unrepairable uh, double strand breaks, which in turn kills the cell. And now that's the main part that how specific this therapy is, because boron 10, as I've told before, it's, it's taken in excessive amounts by the neuroplastic cell. And norm, a normal cell does not take boron 10 or takes uh, basal optic of boron 10. So as this, uh, as this cancerous cell takes more boron 10, so the probability that this uh, neutron will interact with these uh, cancerous, uh, with these cells will all will rises. And thus these, uh, and, and thus the, uh, and thus this N alpha reaction increases in the cancerous cell and we have more amount of alpha particles released in this uh, cancerous cell, but whereas normal cell do not take, uh, do not have enough boron 10. So in the interaction of these uh, neutron to these cells are also poor. So the setup is not effective. So uh, alpha particles which are emitted in this region are very less, but we have more amount of alpha particles in these regions and thus it can, it, it is now depositing energy over these neuroplastic regions. So that's what we want from therapy that we have to deposit more energy to the, uh, to the cancerous cell and we are sparing the normal cell. So that's a basic idea regarding BNCT. So that's a small animation which I will uh, play for. Uh, I will play for you guys. So that's a particle accelerator. So what it does, it accelerates proton. And here we have a, a beryllium source. So 
what basically happens is that uh, when you bombard proton to beryllium, it results in a daughter nuclear related BX and emits neutron. And, and over here, we are getting beam of neutrons, fine. But these beam of neutrons are so high in energy, but uh, are so high in energy, and that's why we have to do something over here. So we have to we have to reduce the speed of neutrons, and there are different mechanism of of reducing the speed of neutron, and that's how at the outcome of this, uh, and because of this mechanism over here, we are getting neutrons which are thermalized. Fine, they don't have higher velocity. So if they have higher velocity, then the probability that this neutron in, will interact with this uh, boron ten is is reduced, and that's why we have to reduce the velocity to make this neutron thermal, so that this reaction becomes much more effective and lead to higher production of alpha particles in the region and, and, and higher cell death. So now we see what goes over uh, here. So that's, um, so this BNCT is very important for uh, treating inoperable cancer, also for invasive cancer, or for those uh, cancer which are, uh, are, which, are uh, which does not respond to the traditional uh, radiation therapy. So, so what we do next basically is that uh, that's the solution that we infuse and that's a special solution because it contains boron 10 along with a amino acid and that's what we call as boronophenylalanine so that's boronophenylalanine and we know amino acid uh, this amino phenylalanine is a very important amino acid and essential amino acid so this boronophenylalanine is a combination of boron 10 and the amino acid phenylalanine and we know that the tumor cells are highly glycolytic in nature they express higher amount of glucose transporting proteins on the cell surface and apart from these these tumor cells also express higher amount of amino acid transporting proteins too fine as we can see over here that as because our uh, uh, the cancerous cell has higher expression of these amino acid transporting proteins and with these transporting proteins this boronophenylalanine enters entry inside the cell and this cancerous cell take more amount of boronophenylalanine than normal basal normal cell and thus we can see there is higher amount of um, boronophenylalanine inside the cancerous cell whereas there are very minimal amount of uh, boronophenylalanine in normal cell and thus when we irradiate this tumor with a beam of thermal neutrons so, uh, so now what we, what we are doing, we are irradiating this uh, tumor with a beam of thermal neutron, then the reaction happens, then boron captures the uh, neutron and uh, results in uh, production of lithium-7 and alpha particle. And those alpha particle goes and attacks the DNA of the cell and it leads to the shrinkage necrosis of the cell and hence uh, we can see how beautiful this therapy works. And we can see that we are irradiating this cell. So, this, so the probability of these interactions are higher in this cell because it has higher fractions or higher numbers of this boron 10. But this normal cell has very poor number of boron 10. So, so the probability of interaction is very is, is very very less or negligible in normal cell. So, what we are doing, we are giving a localized therapy, a very precise therapy to the cancerous cell and, and leading to effective therapy response. So, that's example of the alpha uh, alpha particles um, um, in, uh, in in medical sciences. So, that's uh, boron neutron capture therapy. So now, after discussing about alpha uh, alpha decay process, we'll now move forward to beta decay process. So what is beta decay? So this beta decay process occurs when a nucleus emits an electron. And this electron is, is emitted from the nucleus, but not from the orbital electron. And this beta process and this beta decay can be of two different types. It can be a, a positron decay or beta plus decay or can be a negatron decay or a beta minus decay. And now we'll go deeper inside understanding each decay process in detail and then we'll see the examples which they hold. So that's the schematic of beta minus decay and beta plus decay. So that's carbon 14. And if we go and calculate the uh, proton and neutrons, this carbon 14 contains six protons and eight neutrons. So that's an unstable nuclear because it contains more neutrons then protons and if you go and calculate the n by z ratio over here that's 8 by 6 about 1.3 so that's unstable configuration so what it does it wants to get to a state of 
a stable nucleate. So what it does, it immediately converts a neutron to a proton and an anti neutrino. Fine. And that's the stable configuration in which the NYZ equals to one. That's a stable nucleate. So that's about the beta minus decay in which with we get an electron and a neutrino and you might be asking me how this conversion goes on i guess yesterday navneet kumar from ames new delhi has explained well about how these uh, conversion takes place uh, he took the example of quark model and how these uh, things goes in and out so if we have any questions you can uh, write uh, in the chat box i can mail him to him to explain this uh, once again so now uh, we'll move forward to understanding beta plastic is so what's in a beta plastic is so uh, we can see the example of carbon 10 over here it has uh, six protons and four neutrons it means it has more protons than neutron that is the n by z ratio now becomes four by six about 0.66 uh, six. so so this is not an optimized n by z ratio so it, what it does it converts a proton to a neutron and along with it emits a positron and a neutrino fine and that's the uh, uh, daughter nuclear, which has five protons, five neutrons. That's more stable and a positron and a neutrino is being released. So that's all about beta plus decay or a positron decay. So now, uh, yeah, like in the previous example in alpha th therapy, we have talked about this decay process that we are getting an alpha particle of energy of 5.9 MeV. But when you go for this reaction over here, but we see boron 12 decaying to carbon 12 through a series of beta minus decays, uh, we can, uh, and the Q value of the reaction is about 13 MeV. So it means that uh, we must get a beta, beta particle of energy 13.36 MeV, but that's not the case. We never get a beta particle which has energy equals to Q value, but rather we get a beta particle which has a spectrum of energies. And the number of beta particles which has energy equals to Q value is equals to zero or it tends to zero. We don't have beta particle or even though, even though we have the number of beta particles approaching zero value equals to Q value is very less. Rather, we get a spectrum of Q value and that's the E beta max over here. And that's E beta max is equals to one third of the Q value. Fine. And uh, now the question is, where, where does this extra mass energy goes? And that's being shared by this uh, neutrino and the beta particles. And there comes the concept of neutrino who takes away the extra mass and uh, uh, extra mass and energy. So that's the uh, that's the detector in uh, super uh, super cameo kande in Japan. And this uh, and all of these are photo uh, tubes which are meant to detect the simplest neutrino if present. And it's very difficult to detect the neutrinos. And that's the same detector. Uh, in Super Kamio Kande in uh, in Japan. So now we'll talk about some uh, some important beta decays which are very important for nuclear medicine part of view. And we can see that's moly platinum 99, which has a half life of half time of about 66 hours. So what it does, it decays through subsequent beta decay to technetium metastable, which has a half time of 6.1 hours. Fine. So what, our, what goes from this state, technetium metastable immediately uh, uh, emits a gamma ray photon having energy of uh, 140 AV. And this gamma ray photon is of prime importance in nuclear medicine because this gamma ray photon is being detected by our gamma cameras for, for imaging part of views. For example, we can use this technetium metastable for labeling to any molecules of interest. For example, if we label this technetium with uh, MDP or methylene diphosphate, we can use it for seeing how the bone, uh, how the bone, uh, the, how the, how it, uh, how it localizes the bone, and also we can see that's the technetium um, bone scan over here. So that's uh, gamma ray photon being it can be used for uh, reconstruction of medical images to show how this technetium label pharmaceutical has bio distributed in the body, and this technetium is a prime is of prime importance. So uh, that's the clear decay process how it looks uh, basically but all this diagram looks very crazy very difficult to understand but what we are inter what we are interested in we are interested in this part from where the technique from here okay so from where we have moly 99 mo 99 which decays to uh, which decays to technetium uh, 99m through beta minus decay and then gamma ray photon which is being used for imaging part of view 
and apart from these uh, apart from these uh, these beta decay one of the uh, that's uh, one of the beta decays which i guess we have talked yesterday also in our uh, history of nuclear medicine uh, webinar so i guess i have talked about how c14 was being discovered from uh, by martin de kamen so and in this c14 has a, a very long half life of, of about 57 30 years and it decays to n14 a stable state with emitting by emitting a beta particle and this C14 has a great importance in life sciences because it is being used in carbon dating and we know from our childhood that we can use carbon dating but how this carbon dating is being done. So uh, we know that um, uh, as human beings we are in, in taking carbon source because of our foods, everything is our carbon sources so, and we are also exiting carbon sources. So we have significant amount of C12 in our body and also some fractions of C14 too because C14 are produced by the upper atmospheric phenomena, it can be produced by the cosmic ray phenomena. So we have some fractions of C14 too and as long as we are alive, they are the C14 and C12 are in isotopic equilibrium but the moment you die the equilibrium is not is now not possible it's distorted and now c14 keeps on decaying with a constant half time so now we go for counting statistics and you you, you, go, you go and count how much it has decayed you can give you the time of the death of the specimen so that's how this carbon decay actually works on and apart from this this beta radiations or beta decays are can also be used for the molecular radiation setup example, uh, the most prominent one which you use in the iodine therapy is uh, that uh, the, the thyroid follicular cells have uh, have uh, a transporting protein, uh, what we call as sodium iodide importer, and with these transporting protein, it takes away the beta, it, it takes away the iodine inside this and inside inside the follicular cells. And after that, it decays through beta emissions, it, it deposits energy in, in the follicular cells and lead to creation of molecular lesions, molecular damage, base pair damage, and also higher amount of double strand TNA breakages. And it lead to uh, finally the ablation of thyroid. So that's how these uh, beta decays are used in nuclear medicine and how important these decay are. And that's how the basic science behind those process of, of which we use in clinics are uh, can be understood. And now we move forward to understanding the positron decays. So, if you go and recapitulate it so far, we began with uh, understanding the atomic structure that was though very basic. Then we move forward to the band of stability and many more things. Now we have talked about alpha decay process, BN city, and many more things. Now we are uh, we are we are now uh, moving forward to understanding beta plus decay or positron decay. So that's about beta plus decay, in which we have I have already told that it has more protons. And then neutrons, it, it converts a proton to a neutron and, lo and along with it, it emits a, a positron and a neutrino, fine. And But this reaction is a very expensive, it is because for this reaction to happen, we need a minimum of 1.022 MeV. And if the energy is less than that, then this reaction is not possible. But now the question is why we need um, 1.022 MeV because uh, the uh, for positron, the rest mass energy is about 511 MeV. Um, uh, KEV is so that is the half of this 1.02 MeV, but, but because of why we need this amount of energy because we need to conserve charge and and uh, when you emit one positron, the daughter nucleus emits electron and that's cumulatively equals to 1.02 MeV. That is uh, the rest mass energy of electron is 511, rest mass energy of positron is 511, which sums up to be 1.022 MeV. And that's why this amount of energy is required for the positron decay to happen. That is to conserve charge. And now applications of this positron decay that the most important applications which we can talk about uh, of this positron uh, is that it is used in positron emission tomography. So that's a uh, positron emitting uh, radionuclear catalytic, let, let it be F18. Which we, which we widely use in uh, departments of nuclear medicine. So this positron, this F18 is when decays to O18, it emits a positron. And this positron has a defined path length or defined range in tissue. So it, it goes and interacting, interacts with the electrons in the tissue. It loses energy through, through inelastic collisions. And finally, at this position, this positron has lost all energy. So what it does, the moment it, it has lost all the energy, this positron captures an electron and results in emission of two high energy gamma ray photons. And these gamma ray photons are being used for image reconstruction of medical images. And it shows how 
the pharmaceutical has bio distributed in the body and i guess uh, the uh, this instrumentation part detection part will be covered more detail in the, in the next lecture so how the instrumentation of pet ct works it will be discussed later and how reconstruction works all these things will be discussed in the next lecture session which we will be having today or tomorrow so apart from these uh, pet imaging uh, this positron has a great role in uh, in the measurement of atomic defects though that's this topic is not uh, for our importance, but that's important for material science people because they have to measure atomic defects and whatever uh, things we'll be discussing that not that's beyond my scope, but that's why that's only for information purpose. I'm sharing this uh, information. So, so that's we call as positron annihilation lifetime spectroscopy. What is all about this um, positron annihilation lifetime spectroscopy? So, so what we do that this method is a non destructive uh, spectroscopy technique. Uh, which allows us to study a variety of phenomena and material properties on an atomic scale. And what we do basically, we measure the time between the implantation that would be a material, implantation of positron and the time of the annihilation. And based on that, we'll got to know if there are defects or not and how things goes on. I'm not the expert for this field, so I have no, I have limited idea regarding how this, how this is being used, but still, this positron annihilation lifetime spectroscopy is being used for uh, for uh, understanding material properties on an atomic scale. Uh, next part, we'll talk about the Cherenkov imaging of uh, radioisotopes. So, what is all about uh, Cherenkov imaging? And before we go for Cherenkov imaging, let us know what is uh, Cherenkov radiation. So, that's a, a prompt bluish white light, and that's emitted uh, when a charged particle passes in a dielectric medium with a velocity greater than the speed of flight in that medium. And that's the uh, that's the bluish white radiation, which you can see over here. And this radiation was first observed by Madame Curie in 1910, but, uh, but because of lack of experimentation, she could not uh, perform, uh, she could not explain this thing. But later on, it was explained by P. Cherenkov, I. Frank, and I. Uh, Tam. And uh, finally, they got Nobel Prize for these two. So, um, but now, as you know, that for example, uh, I inject something to this red, for example, F18, and this positron has higher velocity than the speed of flight in tissue, and because of it, it emits a radiation, right? and that is what we call as Cherenkov radiation. And the in tissue, the emitted light is highly scattered, and it absorb it and, and absorbed before reaching the surface. And the tissue optical properties tend to favor the transmission of the red infrared light where Cherenkov uh, emission of emission are minimal. So even though our uh, body produces Cherenkov uh, emission, but because of the low level of light, uh, we cannot detect it. And that's why we need some highly sensitive cameras, and that's the CCD camera, which we call as high sensitivity charge couple devices, which are used for detecting the Cherenkov radiations from these um, from this animal model. So that's how this Cherenkov, uh, that's how Cherenkov radiation is being produced uh, in a uh, in a medium with refractive index N. It's not the it's not the human tissue, anyways. So this, for example, we have a uh, iron 131. It emits beta particles, and these beta particles goes have a have a uh, have a track like these. So this beta particle has velocity more than speed of light, so that's why it emits Cherenkov light. And uh, also, when it goes bombards and in uh, any high areas, it emits bram stirling radiation. And this and these X-rays can go and cause photoelectric emission, Compton scattering, and again can go go for Compton, uh, and again can go for Cherenkov radiation. These are the sequence of events which keep on going. Um, although in human tissues, I guess uh, I guess uh, this bram stirling is not at all possible. Uh, if if possible, maybe very less amount of bram stirling will be possible, and these things are very minimal. So that's how Cherenkov radiations are being emitted, and these are some studies done by those people. Um, on uh, we can find this uh, we can find these things on this paper. And uh, that's uh, FVG kinetics study. We're not interested in understanding how this, uh, how the kinetics work, but as this, that's for understanding part of view. And that we can see we have a renal uptake at time 1.5, but as time goes on, the uptake keep on decreasing. So that's evident from this graph too. And there's the Cherenkov radiation or the Cherenkov light emitted from the reactor core and its bluish in nature. And that's the kinetics of yttrium 90 leveled this, uh, I guess it's antibody. And that's the kinetic study which those people have performed. So yttrium 90 decays by emitting a beta particle. So now uh, we'll try to understand uh, one more part uh, that's about electron capture. So what is all about electron capture? So electron capture is uh, one process that uh, that unstable atoms can use to become more stable. So what goes in electron capture? So during electron capture, an electron 
in an atom's inner shell is drawn into the nucleus where it combines with the proton forming a neutron and a neutrino. So what, what goes over here, this, this proton rich nucleus captures this electron and converts to a daughter nuclear and emits a neutrino. And that's, and that's all about the electron capture. And this electron capture is also called as K capture because this electron capture uh, actually occurs from the K shell. And that's why we call it as the K capture also. So now uh, we can see that in case of positron decay, it occurs when a nuclear has more protons than neutrons. And same goes for electron capture, it has more protons than neutrons. And the reaction is quite different, but still, when uh, now the question is when uh, positron decay will happen and when electron capture will like, happen. So both the processes are very competing with each other. So that's the next part that when uh, positron decay will happen and when electron capture will happen, that's the competing mechanism. So, so that's uh, the schematic which you can see over here. That's a proton rich nucleus. What it does, it captures the electron immediately. And once it captures an electron, it has created a void over here. And to fulfill the void, electron from other shells keep on jumping to the shell, and result of which it emits gamma ray. No gamma ray. That's a X-ray. And which X-ray we call that as characteristics X-ray. And the energy of the X-ray depends on the transition between the two levels. Fine. So what we can see during electron capture, we are getting uh, this. Uh, we, are, we, have, we are also releasing X-ray too. And one. Which we which we have uh, learned previously that for uh, positron decay we need a minimum of 1.02 MeV, but for electron capture we don't need such high energy. We need we, even if, if even if we can uh, we can uh, we can have the electron binding energy we can we are done with electron capture. For example, if we can if we can knock out this electron, then only these things can happen. So the for uh, going for electron capture, it does not require higher energy like positron decay. But if we can overcome electron binding energy, then only these things uh, might happen. It is this thing will happen, and that's when illustrations of uh, uh, positron decay and electron uh, capture in which uh, we begin with 2.8 MeV above the above the neons. A stable state and we required 1.02 MeV to create a positron electron pair and once positron is being released it is over this state at 1.2 MeV above this state and from this state it, it decays to ground state of neon 22 which is more stable and that's all in a positron decay and what goes in electron capture this sodium 22 captures a electron and goes to the same state as of this one and from this state, it goes to the ground state of neon 22. So both of the state has resulted in neon 22. That's more stable state. But now the question is when positron decay will happen and when this and when, when electron capture will happen. So the answer is if the transition between the two levels are higher. For example, this level, the, if the energy gap between two, if, if the transition level between two levels are higher, then probability of positron decay is also higher. And if the gap between two levels are lower, then electron capture is higher as we can see that's from iron 51 to mn 51 we can see as the levels get higher and higher then the probability of positron decay is also higher and as goes lower and lower the positron decay is also lower and lower and same goes for electron capture as the uh, gap is higher then the extent of electron capture is also lower an example of these uh, electron capture pharmaceutical is uh, thallium 201 uh, which is being used in SPECT imaging and it's being used in uh, cardiac perfusion imaging uh, for to assess the coronary distribution of blood flow under high demand and delete imaging can be used to assess redistribution and that's thallium 201 which, which captures electron and converts to AG201 and emits a neutrino along with some X-rays and some gamma rays. So now we are about to end our presentation. That's the last part of the presentation that's on gamma decay process or or gamma emission. So, so gamma rays are nothing but these are high energy photons. So, and these are emitted when a nucleus decays from an excited state to a ground state. So, for example, we can see boron 12, which is in the higher energy state, it decays to the ground state of C12, and the C12 is in an excited state. So, what it does, it decays to C12, which is in a more lower state. So that's a gamma decay process and it emits a gamma ray photon having energy equal to 4.4 MeV. So that's gamma ray photon uh, that's and, the, and, the, and also we should keep in mind that gamma emission occurs from an excited state to a no, lower state of the nucleus. And that's the generalized decay diagram. That's the unstable uh, nucleate over here. 
and it can decay through multiple ways. For example, it goes to a beta minus decay. So what goes in beta minus decay? Proton is being added over here. So you can see there is one more proton, and that's why these we are adding, we are keeping our towards the right hand side because we are increasing atomic number. That's the scale on atomic number and e. So and as in beta minus decay, we are increasing number of protons. So that's why we have to shift towards right side. Fine. And in case of alpha decay, we are losing two protons and two neutrons. So we are losing it, so that will decrease. So that's why we are shifting towards left side. For electron capture of beta minus decay, we are losing our protons. Fine. So that's why we are losing towards uh, left side. And for uh, for uh, gamma emissions, we don't need to change the axis. We'll sh just show like this. Why? Because for like C12, excited to C12 ground, we have six protons and six protons in both the states. That's why we are not changing anything. That's why it will just, it just take a vertical line over here. And now next is about the neutron emission. For example, that's very rare to see, but uh, they, it also happens. Like helium-10, it's extremely unstable. So what it does, it quickly shuts off two neutrons and goes to helium-8. And from this state, it goes through other process to get to stable helium-4. And that's an example of a neutron uh, neutron emission, and which is very un which is very rare to see. And that's uh, potassium-40, that's a special uh, nuclear because it decays through multiple decay process. For example, it decays to ground state of uh, calcium-40 through beta-minus decay. It can decay to argon-40 through electron capture, through positron decay, through gamma-ray photons. So it decays through, through a wide variety of decay process. So it decays through beta-minus decay, positron decay, electron capture, and gamma-ray so in the next presentation, uh, uh, Shrankala from IIT Kharagpur will tell what happens when this gamma ray photon interacts with matter. So in the next session, there we'll talk about uh, interaction of uh, radiation with matter, and followed by we'll talk about how these uh, radiations, how these gamma ray photons are detect are, are being detected by the det detector. So we have a session from Gurkirat on detectors in nuclear medicine. And on the on and on uh, and on the I guess uh, we also have one session how these gamma ray photons are being used for imaging. So we'll talk about how these gamma ray photons are being used for PET imaging, SPECT imaging, how instrumentation goes, or how it works basically. So we'll talk about everything in detail. So uh, thank you very much for being with us. And if you have any question, please write it down on the chat box. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Piproji. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, any questions? Any questions are welcomed in the chat box as well as if you guys turn on the mic and talk. Any questions? Yeah, we have a question in the chat box. What is neutron? Uh, the range of positron depends on which positron you are using. The energy uh, higher the energy, higher higher will be the range. Uh, higher will be the range. So it for F eighteen, I, I I cannot remember the data, but um, for different nuclear, it, it has different range. For gallium sixteen, it has different range. For F eighteen, it has different range. But higher the energy, higher higher will be the higher will be the uh, range. Okay, uh, someone is asking asking me for explaining uh, Cherenkov radiation. So I will share the slide once again. Uh, is my slide uh, visible? Okay, sorry. I guess it's not visible. No, no, it's not visible. Your browser is visible. 